In this video, we are going to look at the topic of finite state machines. First, we'll start by considering what are finite state machines and where would we want to use them. As an example, we'll take up the problem of pattern detection as a sort of toy example that illustrates how we can construct a finite state machine and how it can be used in order to solve a very specific, in this case, small problem. We will also look at how it can be implemented directly using flip-flops and also how we could write very log code that would implement the same finite state machine. The main purpose of understanding finite state machines, of course, is because they play a key role in implementing any complex digital circuitry and therefore understanding how exactly finite state machines work and how they can be implemented is essential to knowing how to design large digital systems. So what is a finite state machine? First, let's understand what we already know about digital logic. Combinational logic is good for computing functions of inputs where there is no memory or state. In other words, the output is directly a combinational function of the input values. On the other hand, we also have sequential logic elements which are explicitly geared towards storing past values. They provide memory to the system. On the other hand, flip-flops have no computational power. They cannot implement any kind of logic. The only thing that they can do is the value that is stored inside the flip-flop, they can control the time instant at which it changes and when it is allowed to change. When we combine both of these together, we can build up a powerful new kind of circuit in the form of a finite state machine. In finite state machines, we use the sequential elements in order to store something that we call the state of the system. This essentially provides some kind of memory and based on that memory and the current inputs to the system, we have other combinational elements that can be used in order to compute next state as well as the outputs of the system. So in a finite state machine, the outputs can depend on the present inputs as well as on some previous notion of state. Finite state machines are common. They are found in all kinds of non-trivial digital systems. Examples would include the traffic light controller, the media access controller used in ethernet, the controller that would be used in a processing unit in order to decide how out of order execution is to uh, perform and so on. And in general, the what we are using as a motivating factor over here is how we can sort of build this up to the point where we can have a programmable finite state machine where we are somehow able to extend the state space of the system. And by doing so, we will see how we can essentially arrive at a general processing element, which will give us a good picture of how a central processing unit or a CPU looks like. So in order to understand finite state machines, let's take an example. The problem that we are given is there is some input sequence. It could be one input per clock cycle, or it could just be something which is being scanned in a certain way. As such, the FSM by itself does not have a notion of time. So even though we naturally tend to sort of say one input per clock cycle and so on, the definition of the FSM does not have any concept of time. It does not really talk about one time instant to the next. It only talks about successive inputs and we are supposed to essentially do some computation and generate outputs corresponding to that. So in this case, let's consider an input pattern as shown over here, 1100, and so on. The problem that we are faced with is that any time that input pattern goes through a sequence 101, we want the output to momentarily become equal to 1. We can see, for example, that there are one segment over here, which basically corresponds to this output. Similarly, there is also another overlapping segment, right? So as soon as the 101, immediately following that is again a 01. And yes, we should also flag that as a 101 pattern. Then we move further on and we find that the next 101 is only later towards the end of the sequence that we have shown. So these three outputs are the instance at which the output becomes equal to one. At every other point, it just remains equal to zero. So what would a finite state machine to detect this pattern look like? We can think of it in the following manner. 
we start with some state S0, an initial state. And the way that we construct it is that we are looking for this pattern. So every time that we get a zero, it's essentially not leading us towards a one zero one pattern. So we just remain in S0. On the other hand, if we get a one, that looks promising. So let's go to a new state and see if we are going in the right direction. Now, if I get a, another one over there, that doesn't really help me, but it does mean that I can remain in the same, same state, S1. On the other hand, if I get a zero, I have now got a one zero pattern, which looks really good. And I move to S2. In S2, if I get one more one, now I can output a one, meaning that I have detected a one zero one pattern. Where should I go next? The interesting thing is I have already received the one corresponding to the next possible one zero one. So rather than going back to S0, I can go back to S1 and await the next zero one sequence again. On the other hand, after the one zero and reaching S2, if I get a zero, it means that the entire sequence has now been lost and I need to go all the way back to S0 and start from scratch. So these three states and the transitions shown over here are sufficient for us to detect the 101 pattern. How do we implement this? We have a few parameters of interest. We have one input, which we will call X. We need to maintain some notion of the state. And since we have three states, we need some way of representing those three states. We need a minimum of two bits in this case because if we choose the value 0, 0, for example, to represent S0, we would need 0, 1 and 1, 0 at least in order to represent the other two states. So a minimum of two bits or possibly more bits could be used in order to represent the states. So we'll call those two bits as P and Q. We have one output of the system, which we'll call Y. Now comes the question, how do we encode the states? The simple way is, after all, we call them S0, S1 and S2, why not just use the binary values 0, 0, 0, 1 and 1, 0 to represent the states? This is fine, this is logical, but it does not really have any justification in terms of what is the best possible circuit implementation. And it turns out that there are ways by which you can actually choose a more optimized or a better state assignment. And the optimization is usually done in such a way that the logic equations are minimized or simplified in a certain way. On the other hand, yet another type of encoding that can be used is to use something called a one-hot encoding. Here, rather than using two bits P and Q, we would actually use three bits P, Q and R and say that if P is equal to one, we are in state S0. If Q is equal to one, we are in state S1. And if R is equal to one, we are in state S2. And at any point, the other two bits must be equal to zero. The advantage of one-hot encoding is that at any given point, we know exactly which state we are just by looking at which of the bits is non-zero. And this makes some of our decoding logic easier. The disadvantage, of course, is that we now need n bits in order to represent n states. And for large state machines, this can be a problem. So why do we even consider one-hot encoding? Because FPGAs have a large number of flip-flops and they actually open up the possibility that one-hot encoding might not be such a bad encoding after all because you can actually make use of the flip-flops and simplify your logic. So once we are done with the state encoding, the next thing to look at is the state transitions. So we have S0 to S1 if X is equal to zero, etc., and so on, all those kinds of transitions that we are interested in. All of this can be captured using the truth tables shown here. We essentially have three inputs, P and Q, the present values of the states, and X, which is the actual input from outside. And with this, what we have is, we want to generate the next value of PN and QN corresponding to the next state, and also the output value Y. All that is written over here is, assuming that state S0 corresponds to 00, S1 corresponds to 01, and S2 corresponds to 1, 0, we have the corresponding output values and the next state encoded. The last two rows over here are actually don't care because the assumption is that we will actually never enter the state. 
we do not have an assignment corresponding to a 1 1 ideally we should never get there if you want to be extra safe you could as we have done over here put in the requirement that if you are in state 1 1 no matter what the input is you return to state s0 with an output of 0 that way you are always going to return to a reset state now that we have these truth tables of course the implementation of the fsm becomes trivial you just need to either simplify or you know just use some kind of logic gate level implementation to achieve this functionality connect up the circuit with the flip flops p q and the next state values p n and q n being computed in this way and you're done of course the assumption there is that since you are using flip flops the x is also arriving one per clock cycle Now, how would we write something like this in Verilog? The first thing that we would need to do is we need to have some enumeration for the states, S0, S1, and S2. We could use some kind of an enumerated data type in Verilog or just use some kind of a local parameter, right? Uh, in order to, uh, after all that we are interested in is to assign some kind of unique values that the compiler can then use in order to represent each of those states. We then need to have something which does the state computation and some other logic that does the next state and output computation. The state update, not the state computation, so to say, but more like the state update is essentially going to happen at a clock edge. And this would essentially correspond to the flip flops where we say that if a reset signal is applied, the state underscore R, which is basically the register corresponding to the state is set to S0 else the state r is set to some variable called state x and what is the state x that is something that would be determined according to the truth table that we saw earlier now how exactly does this truth table get computed we can just put in another always block which would take care of the computation of the next state a common sort of pattern for writing such code is that we have a combinational block therefore it's dependent on the present value of state r and the input by default state x is equal to state r which means that we remain in the same state but then depending on the case where we are depending on the present state state underscore r we say that if xn is equal to 1 the next state should be s1 if we are in s1 and xn is equal to 0 the next state should be equal to s2 and we are in s2 then if xn is equal to 1 or rather if xn is equal to 0 the next state is s0 but if xn is equal to 1, the next state is s1 and more importantly, the x out is equal to 1. So if you go through this logic, you will see that the way this behaves is exactly what we want. The states will get updated as per the diagram that we drew earlier. And the x out value will become equal to 1 only when we are in state s2 and we get a value of 1 at the input. In other words, this very log code has exactly implemented the behavior that we expect from the finite state machine. You'll notice that this Verilog code by itself does not really talk about logic gates or even of flip flops. All of those are inferred and it all this lies in the coding style. The way that it is written automatically means that the compiler can infer this behavior as required. So to summarize, Complex digital systems require state-based updates. You need to have some notion of state which is captured in memory elements and some computation which is implemented by combinational logic. These allow us to implement things much beyond the capability of simple logic gates. And by extending the memory and extending the functionality, it is possible to get much more complex state-based systems, ultimately resulting in a general computational machine which we call a processor core.